So welcome everyone uh, who is uh, presented here and all our uh, online uh, participants as well. Uh, so welcome to our hybrid webinar on uh, introduction to ethics in research, jointly organized by the Global Health Network and the Global Health Network Asia, hosted by ICDDRB. Before starting, uh, I actually want to take the floor uh, to give a brief uh, about the housekeeping uh, rules and some uh, uh, more detail on our uh, webinar. So uh, you can see the agenda. We have firstly we will uh, discuss about the introduction using the TGH and Asia platform, and then we will have basic principles of ethics in research. Uh, we will have a brief discussion on informed voluntary consent, and then we will have a just quick five minutes break followed by a group work and a question and answer session. And lastly, we will be sharing uh, exciting uh, further opportunities of the Global Health Network Asia. Um, so, uh, so sharing just few housekeeping rules to all of you. So the webinar is being recorded and uh, will be shared on the Global Health Network platform and also the Global Health Network Asia platform. So please use the chat box and it would be great if you introduce yourself for any technical issues. Uh, you can share your name and then country name and also the, your organization. That will be helpful for us to for have an interactive session with you. So uh, please use the question answer box to post your question and topics uh, and you can post anonymously as well. Uh, due to number of participants, uh, we, unfortunately, we have to uh, off your camera and microphone, but uh, there may be an opportunity uh, at the end uh, of the question and answer session to speak uh, to the panel. Uh, uh, you can raise your hand as well. So we will enable your microphone and uh, please use the chat uh, function for if you face any technical issues and please uh, message the, glo the Global Health Network platform team. So they will, they, we are all here to support you. Uh, these are some uh, useful links. So our team member will be soon sharing these links. Uh, so you can just quickly explore and uh, see the wonderful opportunities we have within our uh, the Global Health Network Asia and also within our ICDDRB. So without any delay, so I now want to take the floor to introduce uh, you with uh, our regional coordinator, uh, Dr. Salvia Jishan. Uh, so Dr. Jishan has been supporting research and policy work since uh, uh, she got, uh, you know, the uh, her public health and research method training. She is a medical doctor and also has managed multiple global health projects in the areas including access to care, maternal and child health, and also impact of COVID-19. She has developed and uh, managed short-term global health projects in improving access to care for women and children. Currently, she is coordinating uh, the regional team activities related to research capacity development and knowledge sharing in the Asia region. And also, she is supporting us to uh, uh, getting connected with our uh, partners and collaborators of, of Africa and Latin America. So without any delay, I would request uh, Salvia to introduce herself and present the Global Health Network Asia. Over to you. Thank you, Nabila. Thank you for the introduction as well as starting the webinar. Uh, my name is Salvia Zishan. I'm the Asia Regional Manager with the Global Health Network at the University of Oxford. Today, I will be providing an overview of the Global Health Network Asia, as well as the different resources and opportunities that are available on the hub. So you can find what you need to get started or grow in your career as, your, as a researcher. Uh, so the Global Health Network is essentially a network of people who are researchers, healthcare professionals, as well as policymakers, uh, with a central online platform with different knowledge hubs, creating working spaces where people can sh access resources, connect with one another, and also uh, and also share their work for others to benefit from. So you can connect with anybody in the same field as well as geographic location. The Global Health Network promotes career development through its online training courses and resources for conducting good quality and ethical research in multiple different healthcare settings. Uh, in efforts to push the agenda of research capacity strengthening and shift of leadership to the Global South, the Global Health Network has established three regional hubs 
So the Global Health Network Africa, the Global Health Network Asia, and the Global Health Network Latin America and Caribbean are the three regional hubs with coordinating centers overseeing activities in these regions. Uh, the overarching aim of developing the regional hubs is to scale the network with partnerships hosted by research organizations. Uh, these are the three regional hubs with the aim to strengthen the network uh, while scaling it. This is the map of our regional leadership in Asia, and you can see how quickly we are growing. We are working very closely with people and institutes of research excellence in Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, India, and Thailand, and they are being led. Uh, we are. We are being led by uh, our wonderful team in ICDDRB being the regional coordinating center for the global health network in Asia. We are expanding our regional team with coordinators to support the planned work as well as the local needs and priorities of the region. So when we say we are building research capacity in the region, what do we mean? We mean that we will be establishing learning programs, long lasting networks, career development for researchers, as well as embed a culture of research in every healthcare setting. And this will be achieved through implementing many different uh, capacity strengthening activities like provision of learning modules, supported learning sessions, toolkits, developing research clubs, data science clinics, workshops, mentorship programs, as well as supporting grant management, finance, governance, and project management in the teams. This will be achieved through the Global Net Health Network's uh, already existing trusted community of practice, digital platform, teaching, training, and career development resources, and we will be leveraging our partners, strong teams, networks, and experience in delivering health research. I want to bring your attention to the Global Health Network Asia Hub, which is an online platform or working space for the community of practice to access as well as share their own resources. The resources could be in the form of study documents, toolkits, policy briefs. You can register on the hub as a member to be able to get regular updates as well as share your work with us. If you share anything on the Global Health Network, you are assigned a DOI number, which is like a digital foot, fingerprint. So you can get the credit and visibility for your work and you can share it so that others can benefit from it. On the hub, you can find uh, resources and opportunities like upcoming activities and events like workshops and webinars. These are a few examples of uh, what has been uploaded and is coming up. Uh, on the hub, you can also find resources in the form of e-learning courses on many different topics that can support your work. All of these e-learning courses are free, open access, and they are fully online. The courses cover many different steps, processes, and issues in conducting high-quality research. All of these courses are peer-reviewed and regularly updated. You get certificates on completion of the courses. Uh, an exciting thing that is coming up is uh, translation of these courses in many different regional languages. We have already started the process of translating the very popular courses in Bangla, Hindi, and Urdu. There are also available toolkits on, on the hub, which are stepwise and how to guidance to many uh, research processes. And some of these toolkits also support the implementation of research capacity building activities in your team or institute. Country centers, you can find projects, resources, and teams specific to countries in the Asia region. Uh, these are the country centers that we are uh, currently building. Uh, our network and the regional activities are growing, and so are these pages. Uh, I would encourage you all to contribute to these pages and build it along with us. Uh, so I'm hoping that there will be engagement from the participants very soon. Uh, these are the Global Health Network and the Global Health Network Asia URLs. I would encourage everyone to join the network use the resources available, become a part of the existing community and build your own community of shared interest. Please stay connected with us, write to us, let us know what you need, share your work with us and be a part of this very active community and the discussions that can benefit the research being done in your area as well as lead to positive health outcomes for us all. 
Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Alia Nahid to facilitate the next part of the session. Dr. Alia is a scientist and health system specialist, initiative for non-communicable diseases, health system and population studies division at ICDDRB. She's also the regional lead for the Global Health Network Asia. But before I hand it over to her, I would also like to uh, share a little bit about upcoming opportunities. Uh, and one of them is the research club. And uh, Alia and Nabila can share more, but I would just like to tell you that a research club is a platform where researchers engage in, uh, it, 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 researchers who are already engaged in different research projects can come together and share their challenges and experiences. We have to, a toolkit available for how to set up a research club and some of the topics uh, that we would uh, cover in upcoming research clubs are methodologies, ethics, uh, how to work with IRBs, how to write SOP, and tips to apply for higher studies. So all of that is coming up. Uh, please stay tuned uh, and uh, join our network. I would like to hand it over to Dr. Alia now. Thank you, everyone. So thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction and for moderation by Nabila. I can see there are 135 participants in Zoom. And also about 20 participants in the face-to-face -face session. And I really uh, convey my gratitude and thanks to all these about 150 people who are joining here today. So I just want to start saying that I am not here today uh, speaking about introduction to ethics in research because I'm the lead of the, the Global Health Network Asia. <laughs> But because I actually wear a portfolio of ethics training and learning, I have served as an ethical committee member in ICTDRB for six years. And currently, I am also a member of the National Research Ethics Committee, Bangladesh, which is hosted by Bangladesh Medical Research Council. I'm also a member of International Ethical Forum, and we have got many, many works done with international communities for promoting ethics in research. So you can call me. I'm an ethics advocate or ethicist, and, uh, but it is a coincidence that I'm speaking today. <laughs> but it is lovely that I had an opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, so uh, my bad habit is I walk when I talk. So you may not, those who are on Zoom may not see me uh, at some point. So don't be frustrated, you don't need to see me. Maybe you can see the slides. So there will be a break for after the first session. And you will be uh, challenged with a couple of questions. Uh, if you look at the slides, you can see that. Please follow those questions and please write your opinion or answer whenever it is convenient for you. So if you look at the title, it says Introduction to Bioethics in Research. So uh, I, uh, I just want to draw your attention to bio, it is et not just ethics and research, bioethics. So let us talk about what the difference between ethics and bioethics. So is that please? So when you talk about ethics, I think we always get confused or get uh, uh, a lot of uh, think that ethics, moral, these are all similar words, probably they are. Uh, but the way the question of ethics comes, maybe a couple of idea, perspectives, like what does that mean? Like maybe it says it may be the honesty, it may be the fairness, or maybe the integrity values. So lots of things are coming in. But ethics is basically a broader field. It can be uh, implemented in each and every sector, in, an, in every minute of our life, whatever you do, when you talk, when you walk, when you work, when you plan on anything, there is some ethics because we are, we are human beings. We have moral obligations and we have ethical obligations as well. So basically that is a broader field to understand the concept of the right and the wrong and then differentiate between them and also understand what is moral and what is immoral. Not immoral, it should be immoral. Okay, so uh, next, next slide please. So come to the topic of bioethics. And bioethics is actually a part and parcel of the ethics in research. So whenever we are talking about application of ethical issues 
relating to any kind of biology or biological system. It can be anything. It can be biomedical things related to human being. It may be animal biology. It may be environmental biology, or it may be a public health or just simple research where there's no health issues. So everywhere there's an ethical issue, ethical thing involved in it. But bioethics is not just a concept, bioethics is also study. So this is built on uh, decades of um, learning from man's wrongdoing to human beings, not yet to animal, yet to human beings. A moral thing, unethical thing done to human beings that actually gave rise to the discipline bioethics. Next slide, please. So it is not just social, it is also legal issues that are also included. But the difference between ethics and legality is that for things that is violating legality of an action can be brought to a court and justice. But in ethics, it is basically you are the court of your own conscience. And there is rarely, rarely any punishment given for ethical violation of research conducted uh, again uh, with human beings. Before I go into the basic concept, I just want to give a snapshot of a few important events in that, that happened in this world. So one uh, research that happened in the USA that is famously known as the Tuskegee Syphilis Study uh, that happened in 1932 to 1972, that was almost 40 years long, but that was beginning of understanding or thinking about ethical issues in research, that's the beginning. But we really got our ethical codes, disciplines, guidelines, when the World War II was over and there was a trial, Nuremberg trial, probably you have heard of it, but I don't know how much you know, if this generation knows about it, but that trial found out what uh, crime has been conducted to hum humanity in the name of research. So that gave us a very strong concrete ethical guidelines that is the beginning of our future guidelines developed across the globe. But there are many others that will talk about it later. So you can see a picture. This is a court full of military sitting in, in the room. And that is actually the origin of contemporary research ethics. And what it means, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So let me start with the Tuskegee study. This Tuskegee syphilis study was conducted by the Center for Disease Control in the US. The goal was to understand what happens to syphilis when someone gets it. In the US, there was a common belief or perception or misconception that it is sort of race issue and it is the African-American who gets syphilis. At that time, when the study started in 1932, Penicillin was not yet uh, invented. You know, penicillin was invented in 1947. And penicillin is the treatment of syphilis. And uh, it, is, it is the time before that. So the researchers really wanted to, uh, researchers, American researchers in uh, Tuskegee, which is uh, a village in uh, Alabama. So they wanted to research on African-American men uh, to understand what happens in syphilis if it is not treated? Because there's no treatment at that time other than some uh, very harmful treatment with arsenic and is a toxic effect. So there's no cure at, uh, known to the medical community. So 600 African-American people, uh, men were actually uh, recruited with a consent form, I'm coming to that, but 399 of them had latent syphilis and uh, it was meant for enrolling men with syphilis and there are 200 plus in the control group. And what was in fact, there was a consent for, and this study was conducted mostly, uh, uh, conducted on African-American. And those who conducted the study, they were also uh, African-American doctors and nurses and folks. So uh, these people were asked, these participants were told that uh, Study is going to, you are going to a part of the research where you get free medical care and for treating your bad blood. And you will get a special free treatment and that uh, it is very special and for limited access. 
and that is a spinal tap. Spinal tap is a procedure that we, uh, the doctors actually collect a spinal fluid for detection of syphilis, which is a bacteria inside the cerebrospinal fluid in the body. So they test it in the laboratory. So it was a very invasive procedure, painful procedure to uh, make people uh, um, agree to participate in the spinal tap. They said these things, which is not true. And they said they get free treatment, but they were given only some placebo uh, treatment, which is there's no treatment actually. And what happened, this they were first told that you, you are going to participate in the study for six months only, but that study continued 40 years. The uh, US government didn't have the funding to continue after a, uh, after a year or two, I forgot how many years. And, but the doctors continued the study, but the, harm, the harmful part of the study was these people were never told that they had syphilis, 1499 people. They were told, they were never told that they have syphilis. And in 1947, and they can die from this and they can develop complications if not treated. And they were not even allowed to get even traditional treatment that was available at that time. And wherever they, wherever they went for, anybody knew about it, went for treatment, they were refused. In the meantime, in 1947, antibiotic. Uh, penicillin was uh, discovered, and and it was the, it was found that is the best treatment for curing sickness. But this information was uh, kept secret from the participants, and they were never allowed treat, treatment or even prevented from getting treatment. At the end, after forty years, it turned out about I forgot the name. So majority like the majority of the men they. Uh, they, 80 people died, and I think a uh, so lot of uh, died directly from syphilis, and a greater majority died from the complication of syphilis. And about 44 of the men they, they, they transmitted syphilis to their wives, and uh, this the 19 couple gave birth to children. 19 children were born with syphilis, and all this could be prevented when penicillin was invented if they are treated, and it is very quick treatment. It does not kill. So this was never known or picked up by anyone until and unless a, a journalist, a, a team member actually picked it up and tested that this is not ethical in human trust. And he actually shared with the journalist's friend and it came to a local newspaper and it flared the government, the CDC and the US government public health department. And then the next thing was that this Belmont report was actually uh, developed. And this Belmont report was based on the respect for persons who participated in said, beneficence, which is a very old English that means benefit, and justice. So this Belmont report is the nickname of the big report that was ethical principles and guidelines for the protection of human subjects of research. And it was a report of the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavior Research. So that was the first uh, guideline that came up with some kind of concrete ideation. But, but time has passed, but this kind of inhuman activities in the name of research did not stop. And there was the Nazi experimentation during the World War. This Nazi party in Germany, probably you know that they believed in their blue blood of race, high race concept. So they, they wanted to exterminate the Jews from Germany and maybe from the war. And they, uh, they in the during World War, they, when they held these uh, many Jews in the, uh, in the concentration camps, they conducted many research. And that those researches conducted between 1942 to 45. And uh, when the Nuremberg trial, that was a trial after the World War uh, that were uh, investigated, 23 German physicians were charged and they were put on trials for doing crime against humanity in the name of research. And those are labeled as twisted ethics in the abominable medical experiment during the Holocaust. And you know the Holocaust is the genocide of European Jews during the World War II that happened between 1941 and 1945. 
So what happened to these German physicians? They were tried, 16 were found guilty, seven were executed. Some of them were, some of them died naturally, some of them were life sentenced. So, so I think I don't recall of another event. Someone may know, please write it, you know, in your chat box on share with us who are, who are present. Probably this is the only time when a researcher or scientist were put on court and tried and got punishment for doing wrong thing to the human being. Next slide, please. So let us go give a little bit of snapshot. This is maybe this disturbing. So who have very soft mind, weak heart, please pardon me if that hurts you. So there are seven or eight experimentation that's infamous. And if you go to the Wikipedia, Google, you will know this. So one of them was the Motion Hypothermia Project. And most of it started with the mostly to uh, find a solution for the soldier. So this study was when their um, pilots in the air fight were shot down to the ground in the snow. So it, that is very cold, um, temperature zero. So if they are uh, very cold, whether cold at to cold sea, so seawater. So how they can be how they can survive? What are the mechanisms that they can survive? So what they did? So that was the, the, the study was conducted in uh, concentration camp in Dachau, that's in Germany, between 1942 and 1943. So what they did about, I think it is about uh, 300, 300, if I believe me, 300 prisoners where who, those are also soldiers from different armies, they are held imprisonment. They were uh, put in, in a very cold water, ice cold water, submerged in icy water, and then they were put to different different strategy or uh, mechanism to rewarm them. Some of them put in the warm blanket, some of them were put directly in hot boiling water directly, and, and it is disturbing to say some were also forced to do sex. And there are many other things they did just to see how they can reward the five bodies. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, so majority, I mean, there's a big number of uh, inmates that died from this experiment and they, those who survived, they suffered. So this is one emotion hypothermic project. The next slide, next, next one, please. So let me give another example. These are high altitude studies. This study was meant for their air crew when there is a, a air fight and the plane was going to be crashed. So how, how what is the altitude in the, uh, in the air? The, the crew could actually eject their, eject to save themselves. And they can still breathe. They, have a, they can still survive from the minimum amount of oxygen. So there were about 200 uh, prisoners. They were put in a box chamber where oxygen was taken out and they were observed how long they survived. And this is how they observed one after one, say 200 were just tested and each of them died, lack of oxygen. And the rest of them who survived, they were murdered. And there was a report from one of the uh, one of the witness that some of the doctors, famous, there is a famous doctor, he actually cut the brain to see when, what happened to other organs, brain and other organs after this test. So you can think of who can do this, such brutal thing, things like this. So, so there are many other, I don't, uh, there's no time, maybe it will take weeks to talk about this. But all these were proven to be a uh, crime against humanity. And there is a belief and there is a clear understanding that researchers, particularly doctors, can ha have the ability and uh, freedom to do anything to the patients in the name of research. They think that is to be stopped. The problem was that these Nazi physicians did not get any consent and they were forced to participate in this uh, so-called research. And after this trial, they would have got the punishment, but at the same time, they took the committees. They came up with a code of conduct that is uh, called the Nuremberg Code, that's the famously known. There are 10 basic points, and all these points were around voluntary consent. 
of the said participant. Beneficence with benefit of the participant. Non-beneficence means no harm. Then scientific validity don't do any research with our unbelievable scientific robustness. And finally, respect for the human dignity, which was totally lost in this particular time of this. Next slide, please. So this study, uh, I mean, not study. So this Norimbar cohort actually was the beginning of many guidelines, like uh, then uh, uh, World Medical Association, actually the, for the first time developed that elaborated guideline and that is famously known as Helsinki Declaration. Mm -hmm. Helsinki Declaration came from that Nuremberg Codes, uh, the basis of the Nuremberg Codes basis. And after that, the International Organization of Medical Sciences, in short, we call it CIOMS. CIOMS actually developed many other guidelines for different kinds of studies and that became the basic of the ethical guideline. And every country, nowadays, every country, has an ethics research committee at the national level who is responsible to oversight ethical issues um, in human research. So just give you an example. So next slide, please. So what are the principles for all these four? There are four principles actually. So all these ethics review committee, all the guidance talk about the respect for autonomy. Autonomy means your decision-making capacity. You have the right to make your own decision. You are, you have autonomy. Then beneficence, of course, if there is no benefit, there is no need of research. non maleficence if a research causes harm, it cannot be allowed. And justice, it must bring justice to the research participants. If, if there is injustice in the name of research, that can be allowed. These are four principles and any guidelines you can think at that develop that are developed at, at the global level by global communities or revised uh, or adopted at the local level by different countries. Next slide, please. So let me talk about a little bit about what is this, these principles, four principles. Do you know the respect for autonomy? This autonomy means particularly protecting the right to make a decision by everyone participating in research, treating them with courtesy doesn't matter who is rich or who is poor, who is educated, who does not understand whatever you're talking about, he said that doesn't matter. We have to speak in the same language that the participant would understand so that you, you respectfully convey your information about research so that they can make the decision on their own. Disclosure of interest is very important while you are doing the research. Is it your personal interest or it is a global interest, local interest, whatever the interest, even if it is a your master's thesis, it has no value, but if we don't do it, it this is such, I will not get my, uh, I mean, my MPH degree or MS degree. That is also disclosure, to tell that. And of course, all this respect for autonomy also allows people to apply their self-will to independently choose whether they want to participate or not. Yes, that's. They talk about the beneficence and non beneficence This is the uh, mid, uh, points, uh, two sides of one coin. So in order to ensure that it, research must do good, but that doesn't mean that only good, doing good is not enough. Researchers need to prevent from any kind of potential harm or evil that may happen directly or indirectly as a part of the research process. Do no harm is not enough. You also have to remove any kind of evil or harmful element in any part of the research so that there's no question of harm. But in order to promote good balance between benefit and harm, researchers need to maximize the research participants' benefit. Maximize the research participants' benefit, not the researchers' benefit, remember that. And minimize any kind of risk that may incur from the research. Yes, like this. So justice is a very broad thing, but justice can be violated anytime if someone's not conscious about it. So equal access to the, in, to the care or minimum or standard care, uh, then right to get any kind of information related to a study, uh, related to the problem the research is focusing on, what is the right to decide fair distribution of any kind of cost that may be disbarred to the research participants or the research community that should not be uh, deviation for making decisions 
who should get more, who should get less. And of course, if there is any benefit from the research, it should be equal distribution of research. Not that only those who are sick, they get the benefit, but who are research volunteers but do not have any health ambition, they don't get benefit from the research. So this is a very tricky thing, right? We do research for, for, for health research for uh, sick people. So how can you also ensure the control group who are not sick, right? Is a question. So we we'll talk about it. So next slide. As I mentioned a little bit earlier before, all these four principles adopted by the FX body of any, most of the countries where they are responsible for formulation, for coordination and promotion of ethical guidelines in their country for conducting biomedical research. So I'm just giving a few example. You don't need to remember it, but just to let you know that it may sound, okay, does study happened back in 1943, uh, then the Nuremberg came 1945, and you can see on slide that you have to take care of health thinking. So, so the, the world is now well educated, well aware, and they have ethics in place. Wrong. There are still many countries where there is no proper ethics review committee board at the national level. If you just look at a few, I just picked up a new name. So, so in the in, in Indian Council of Medical Research, is one of the oldest ethics committee in the world. And Pakistan followed after several years. But Bangladesh had its first medical research council right after its independence. That is quite impressive. But if you look at the Nepal Health Research Council, that was established in 1991. And the Philippines had a Health Research Ethics Board that was established in 2006, official. But maybe there are many groups, uh, maybe actions are taken before, but official, or formal council was uh, uh, developed a few decades ago. So there are still uh, processes going on in many countries. But why, what is the role of these committees? A lot of people think, even sometimes some RMA members also think that we should also look at the risk, risk, uh, interest of the research for the sake of the research, because without research, we cannot bring human benefit. Uh, so we need to allow research. At the same time, IRP is tasked with a very important job to protect the human subjects, which is research participants. So they have to be careful about the benefit of individual research participants, not an only group. The individual participants must be benefited from this. They should be protected from harm. They should be treated fairly so that someone gets more, someone gets less. It cannot happen. And there cannot be any research without justification of the benefit of research. It's scientifically valid, it's a valid reason for doing a research. And of course, the participant must understand the value of the research and self and willing, willingly, willfully, they commit a concept to participate. But equal fair treatment, equal treatment is very important. Equal treatment sometimes it is very difficult. But in terms of racism or bias, this happens all the time, such as we always think of if there is rich and poor, we, in some time, times there's a debate. So all the different benefits are given to uh, women in maternal child health, right? So there are husbands in the families, they don't get any benefit, but it's part of the research. So that kind of debate also comes in. So, but there are some things about racism, bias, or the socioeconomic, um, discrepancy, this should not be uh, induced uh, by any research, and that is the role of the IRB to look at it. So how we start that? The ethical review committee, other than the research robustness, which is very important, without having a good research, uh, research cannot be ethical. But apart from that, uh, ethical review committee starts its first review, other than research review, research uh, report, uh, research protocol review, is the informed voluntary consent. Informed voluntary consent is the starting point of ethical practice in a research, and it is for the protection of the research participants. And remember, these are volunteers. So because they are volunteering their time, efforts, and their information, it is some very personal information, they are volunteering to give benefit to other people through your research, 
So you have to carefully treat them with full respect so that they give the consent after getting full information. And this is this process is just just don't stop at the enrollment. It, it continues to the entire research process throughout the study. And where does it stop? Next slide, please. So we will talk about it. So why we need the informed voluntary concept? This is the process. Because this is the only way if you can demonstrate you are protecting the rights of the research participant and giving them protection, both at the individual level and at the community level. Because the individual is protected, but for the research, they live in a community. Because of participation in the research, if there is any problem of that participant living in a community or a uh, or, uh, so, or interacting with other people in, in the neighborhood, we have to also be diligent about it. This is important because you need to empower the participant to make a decision and make a determined decision, not that you uh, are uh, giving, false, uh, giving false information or fabricating some information or tempting or giving them some kind of uh, hope even hope or unfair benefit or financial benefit or service benefit or some other thing, even gifts, that cannot be allowed. So it should be transparent, not based on an inducement concept, right? But this is also a transfer of responsibility between researcher and the research participant. What is that? The research participant makes a decision Willfully, whether they participate or not, only one when they are informed well about the research and they have the power and autonomy to make the decision whether, whether they participate in the research. But at the same time, the researcher is in an agreement with the, partici uh, with the participant, and participant is in agreement with the researcher that they will jointly do some activities, that is the role of the researchers. What, is, what are the roles of the participants, right? Uh, I allow researchers to come to my home. I give them time. I give them data they need. I give them samples if that is the case. This is agreement. So it, informed voluntary consent process is also an agreement. And in, in, in case of any agreement signing, you read it, right? You never sign any legal agreement without reading. So this is also something written down. Except this. So what was, I was trying to tell that where does consent start? Where does end? So start, research is a cycle, right? You start from enrollment, then you, after subject enrollment, you do data collection, then you, your data are entered, and they are analyzed, then data interpretation, management is done, data analyzed, interpretation done, then you write the report, right? And then you disseminate, and sometimes you publish. So who can tell? I'm also uh, asking the people in the Zoom as well, and in the room. Yeah. So where are, where does it start? Where does consent process start? At which point? There are several boxes. Anyone from the audience? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you should allow. Just one or two. I hear some question. Is there a question here? Okay. So, or you can also write. Is there anyone in the room who can? Okay. okay. Hello. You said enrollment. Enrollment. Dhruva? Enrollment. Where does it end? Where does it end? Publications, so, okay. We have one from the online as well, yeah. raise your hand. So, so please, give, what is your opinion? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah, okay, so basically it starts at enrollment and, and um, it ends at, uh, ends at uh, publication because in the publication sometimes, you know, uh, disclosing someone's name without the consent is still the crime as the previous one that you described over. Great. So, so you can say that she starts from enrollment and ends in publication. But what if I say 
you got a draw, right? Someone said data collection, stars are data collection. So constant starts way before. Next slide, please. Constant starts, consenting process starts, informed voluntary consenting process starts before you go for enrollment. What is enrollment? The enrollment is when a research participant signs to agree to participate in the study, right? The enrollment starts, but you, your consenting process starts before that. Sometimes when you go to a community study, we go to a gatekeeper. Maybe we go to a government, a government health authority to get their permission to work in health facilities run by the government, right? Our health facility provider, a doctor or nurse is our participant. But this consenting process would start from very beginning from the government sector because whenever you, even if you need to get a, an approval from the DG Health, Director General of Health and Health, you have to tell them what the study is about, what the, what is, what is the benefit of the research, where there is no harm, no uh, problem, or the parts of we are not going to do any harm, this is the thing we need to do. So it starts from there, but it is very difficult to formalize it, right? But you have to stay, uh, I mean, you have to stage the whole process way ahead of, but when you go to the participant, that is the time of execution, right? So you have to think about this consenting process, what should go in the form long before. So that is I'm trying to tell you. So once you enroll, you already have given all the information. You can still give more information if you want uh, in the course of the research. But this consenting process does not only start at any publication, in every sector. After enrollment, you when you collect data, there are ethics in data collection, ethical issues in data collection. You have to remember, what you have told the participants about data. Are you really adhering to that? When you are managing data, when you are analyzing data, there are ethics in data analysis, data management, and there's a data manager in my, uh, among the, I, and there's ethics in it. You probably don't write that down in the consent form because this is not a participant's job, it is the job of the research team, how ethics and data management can be adhered to. This is so important to be ethical while you do data analysis, right? Not only look at the p value less than 0 0.05 and ignore others. And my paper is published in high impact journal. That is unethical. You have to look at the real problem, either positive or negative outcome. Trial is negative, giving negative results. It's also important to publish. If we only publish positive trials, we are doing injustice to the society. We can't tell our community. This kind of intervention is harmful for the society or others of no benefit. This must be published, right? So this is the bias of the journals and we can talk about it in another session. But in dissemination also, right? In publishing reports, someone said that uh, on Zoom. Yes, during dissemination, if there are sensitive issues, the community is identified, what may happen to them? They may be stigmatized, they may be labeled. There are so many instances. So there are so many ethical issues, we can't uh, talk about all of them in one session. But trust me, each and every topic that we're seeing in the box will require whole day discussion to understand and identify what are the ethical principles in research. But this process continues, as I said, it doesn't stop the publishing, it continues. Like when you publish, what is the benefit you bring to the community? Publish research. And what? There are, there are many questions coming up now in large grant uh, I mean, guidelines. What is there for the community after the research is over? But what, this is always a dilemma for the researchers. What should go in the information of the informed voluntary consent? What is informed? So when you say informed consent, it is not about giving information and giving them uh, this is the information. It is actually understood whether the participant, whether the participant understood what you have talked about. Like the, the dilemma is when you are doing a research in a hospital setting or clinical setting, it's very difficult because you're a doctor, you're a nurse or you're a health worker you provide any kind of service to, to the patients and you're doing research with them as well. So it is very difficult to distinguish between the research 
and the service, right? So when you do research in your form, consent form, you have to clearly delineate that this is the research, nothing to do with your service you're getting. This is, this is a very difficult thing to make a sharp distinction between these two. You must talk about benefits that may come out of it. What are the risks? Even minimal needs to be taken. But this is really important when you do research, but the individual has privacy, the personal privacy that must be maintained, the dignity must be maintained. And also the research, research participant is providing you with a lot of information, personal information. Doesn't matter whether it's sensitive or no, this is how his or her personal information. So this is confidentiality to maintenance. It's very important. It's very important for respect to human dignity. And what is benefit that I just said, research is over, that is not enough. What can come as a benefit future in the future? And what did you do? What can you talk about in the consent form to establish the right to refuse or not to participate, part participate or withdraw a research participant anytime? So this is also important. And of course, giving all the information related to the research is very important. So these are rule of, rule of thumb for informed uh, but how you do that? Let, let's go to the next slide. As I mentioned, uh, voluntary, it is easy to say voluntary that you disclose information, you give adequate opportunity to make a decision, you assure that participant understood it, and they are giving consent voluntarily, not being induced by any kind of portion or by bribe or uh, in exchange of service or fees, reimbursement. But is it easy? Next slide, please. Is it easy? Is it voluntary process? It should be voluntary. I just mentioned, when you, in your, in you, you are in a biomedical setting, you are getting research participant, consenting a research participant with your patient. How can a patient to say, oh, doctor, I don't want to participate in your research? Also, that they don't understand the difference. Second thing, they think, oh, you're the God. How can you do harm to me? Yes, I trust you. And we work in the community, the poor communities in Bangladesh. We face it all the time. So recent participants, or it's always oh, just a doctor. How can he or she do harm? It, is, it must be something good for us. They participate. So if you don't give the opportunity to help them understand, they, you are not giving them the autonomy to make a decision, right? So this is a benefit of doubt. So there is always a difference when you are doing research with treatment and this treatment is not available and the patient is getting this treatment for free for his or her condition. So how can you ensure it is voluntary? There's always a component of bribe and coercion, right? So this is this is a very fine line you have to think about how you how you remove that and empower the patient, patient or participant to participate in research voluntarily. And often it is the participant is not alone. They have to listen to their families. Women need to listen to their women need to listen to their husbands, that are in-laws in South Asian society most of the time. And there is always an issue of um, desperation. Like I am sick. I am having tuberculosis. It is such a I don't I don't have access to treatment. There's this group of researchers coming with a research a request where I'll get free treatment. I will definitely go to get the treatment, right? So how I can differentiate this benefit by, I mean, for, uh, for, in exchange of a benefit, someone is participating in research or it is absolutely selfie. Oh, I'm not induced by any kind of uh, portion or uh, benefit, but I understand this is going giving benefit to other people for societal benefit. And sometimes it is very difficult to make process voluntary when you are working in a hospital, crowded hospital, crowded community, right? So you, you, this is something you have to ensure that the environment, the ambience is uh, offering full time and attention for the participant to listen to you, understand what you're talking about, and then they're given consent. So when you talk about voluntary consent, we have to make the consent completely voluntary. So how can you make the consent completely voluntary? You have, in your consent form, in your, you have to talk about, you are the sole authority to make a decision. You don't need super, super someone to guide you or get permission or, um, 
So you you can refuse to participate now, even before I talk to you. But it is always important that even if you refuse to participate, please listen to what we what we want to do or inviting you to do in, in our research, and then you can refuse. No problem. They must be empowered to participate or uh, withdraw anytime during the process of consulting, even after consulting. Even when the research is over, if, if a participant comes back to the research team and say that I, I participated in your research in such and such time, but I don't want to participate anymore. It is the right. I have to take out their data from the uh, database. Or if this is really important, we have to mention because I was always telling you when you do research in a clinical setting or with this for people who need care and the research is offering care for free, they uh, it is very difficult for them to refute at the same time they think, oh God, if I don't participate, I may be penalized. I may not be treated. My child may not be getting the best treatment of the hospital. So the, they have to talk about it. It has nothing to do with that or will not be penalized, will not be really loss of benefit. Uh, and uh, you will still get, not only here, it's really a good care, even in hospitals setting like our CPT are where the region, the global network is most clear. We have a, a hospital of diarrhea patient. And if you go to uh, uh, into recent, or into recent participant from hospital, we always tell them that if you don't participate in the research, there is no problem getting the treatment you're getting in this hospital. So don't worry about it. Yes, so, 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 so this is how you can ensure the voluntary the, or if, if information provided enough to make the process voluntary. But there is a uh, good uh, set of rule for developing consent form and a good informed voluntary consent form should have this uh, subtitle or heading in the form, like what is the purpose of the research, risk benefit, how anonymity, confidentiality, privacy will be maintained, what will be done with the few, with data in the future, what is the right of the participant, and what is the what right to withdraw, what is the compensation which the participant may get, and giving them all the information. And finally, if it, providing a signature, a calm impression is very important. I, I will quickly go over all of them one by one, very quickly. So purpose of the research. This is something uh, many times I have seen a consent form, biological consent form. The researcher is uh, using uh, jargons of medical literacy, by God. Uh, and uh, they said, how can I translate that in a layman like way? In, even though the English terminology, how can I translate that in Angla, our local dialect, and make the consent form understandable by the layman? As a member of the Ethics College, we always accuse that. There are ways, such as we, if you will say, when we talk about the speech study with the spinal tap, if you see what to do spinal tap, the patient will never understand. You have to tell, we want to insert the middle in your. Um, backbone to collect some fluid that will be tested in the laboratory. Without that testing, we will not understand whether you are infected with syphilis. That's the only way we do that. We we'll agree, we can do that. So this is exactly they are telling this final tab will be done at the central ICD therapy laboratory for cardiac testing. We are talking the same thing, right? But this is how this is the art and your willingness. How much you want to make it more understandable? In local language in very simple manner so that anybody with any level of education, any level of understanding of biomedical science, they can understand. I, uh, and this is also very important. The language is very important. And second thing is very important is that we have to keep all the steps of the research. We need to do why you're doing the research and what are the steps will you follow in, in this research and what they need to do in, in terms of uh, participation in the research, what the person needs to do, how frequently they need to do it, how much time that will be taken, uh, whether there's any harm, anything that, that's coming a little uh, later, and uh, they must be to told whether this is, there's any benefit, or uh, it's a part of the research or not, all these things must be told in the concept form. Next slide, please. 
to benefit. In, in most of the, I think, I don't know uh, other countries, but uh, that I have been, that I have sat in, I have always seen IP members are very serious about the benefits and the risk. So there should be always distinguish, uh, di distinguishing. So what is the research benefit? Or what is our risk benefit? So why you are doing the research and how that will benefit, who will be benefited? And when is it with the benefit will happen right away when the research is being conducted or it will be provided any benefit later sometime? We have to tell it clearly whether the participant will get any benefit for himself or herself, or it is for the future. Someone like you would get some benefit, not you, not today. But if these things the develop intervention success, someone will get benefit. You have to tell it, be explicit, don't hide any information. Don't give false impression. And this is really important to tell them if there is any service included in this research. So for example, we are doing hypertension trial. And as a part of the trial treatment, monitoring the treatment is important. So giving intervention as a treat treatment is an intervention. And you're giving drugs to control that hypertension. And then monitoring. The whole, this is the process of treating hypertension as well. And, say, and I think that in the rural villages, in the health setup, the primary care facilities, this hypertension care is not available, drugs are not available. So the participants get this uh, treatment for free, both the drugs and the prescriptions, the doctor's examination. The research is that. This is also benefit of research, right? So the participant getting the benefit of research immediately, and the result will benefit the community in the end. So you have to carefully the other side of the story would be, say for example, this, this study does not give any intervention or treatment for hypertension, but only provides education. But identifies who has any potential or no, by raised blood pressure. But once you find an individual with raised blood pressure, it is the ethical obligation to give treatment, but this study does not include treatment. What will you do? Anyone? The study does not include treatment, but the patient, the individual has hypertension, needs treatment. What can you do? It is not a part of research, but it is an ethical obligation. You can, you can give give samples to uh, use your try to be careful for treatment. Excellent. This is exactly. There is sometimes there's a debate in the ethical review committee. Oh, the researcher must introduce the treatment as well. They need to find budget for that. This is not essential until unless this treatment is a part of the research. So researchers need to negotiate or arrange so that this ethical obligation of giving treatment to the patient is met. You understand? And it, it should be the minimum standard of care that is available in the local setting or in the country. So there is a so you understand research benefit and service benefit. And, but you should not do something, oh, uh, uh, we are um, uh, giving a trial of a very expensive medicine, you will get it, and other will not get it. So you are getting the very expensive treatment, other will not get it. So we do participate, you, you are in the intervention group, you, will, uh, you can get a very good quality drug for yourself. This will be portion. But if you say that you will be getting a, a drug that we don't know, how that will benefit you, uh, it may have a good uh, outcome, good, uh, good uh, control, or may not have a good control. We don't know. That's for just thing. That's a really right? If it is an open level trial, or that means that the patient and research, uh, participant researchers both know what the drugs are being given to the person. So that will not be coercion. But if we try to drive or uh, give them some hope of better betterment, that will be coercion. But there are difficulties. If it is a social research, you are looking at the data, say for example, for demographic things or migration, it is very difficult to get some benefit, right? What benefit will get go to the participant or the community? Maybe that will be beneficial for the country, for the population level intervention, but there is no benefit for the individual participant. But it must be told implicitly so patient or participant understand 
there's no benefit. Next, risk. This is what, what we are always worried about. Any kind of risk, even if it is not apparent, it must be taken. Say, for example, uh, we collect blood sample as a team. Uh, so, for example, uh, you are uh, coming back to hypertension trial. So, so it, for the hypertension patient, the patient needs to be uh, giving blood for testing their whether raised blood pressure is called the kidney damage, right? So, this is also objective, but it also benefits for the participants. If kidney has been damaged, then they will be getting treatment also as a part of the reason. But so it is it is also a routine test like serum creatine. I think everybody knows about it. So we did do that test. It's a very routine, very common routine test. This and we do it all the time. There's no harm. But if in a hospital a doctor is prescribing for serum creatine and asking permission, which is nobody will talk about ethical issues. It's a routine, that must be done. But when you do the same test in a research environment, you have to tell the participant, oh, this is a routine test, but we're doing it for your for this study. But you may have, have a prick on your hand for the collection of blood, and, uh, and sometimes there may be swelling and blackening on the skin. Blood may clot down. You may have some momentary pain. This is risk, right? But you have to also say how this risk will be mitigated. We will be providing trained technologies to collect blood, and uh, we will sterilize the place of the blood collection on your skin so that no infection occurs afterward. And if anything happens, we provide a treatment at, at our own cost and we'll make sure you don't have any discomfort anymore. But still, if you have discomfort, we discontinue the study. So you can see how you, this is a routine thing. If it is a research, like blood collection for serum creatine test, it, 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 there's no harm, but there may be some potential damage, but it must tell it before it, before the participant says, oh my God, my hand is swollen, my hand is black. My blood has clotted because of this little pricking on my, into my hand. Because the research participant, if you have empowered itself participant to make a decision, right? This is what you want. This participant may refuse, oh, you have hurt me. You have to compensate. But if you have already told the participant, you have already staged the environment, so the participant will not be misunderstand. Participant was aware that certain things, such things could happen. And this is how they are going to mitigate the risk. And after knowing that, they will be agree to allow you to collect the blood. So similarly, where you refer the patient as a part of the research, what will happen after the refractive facility? What will be the cost of treatment? Anything, you have to, you have to talk about that for the, for participation of the research have to come to the center so it will cost you 20 20 local taka or 30 uh, ringgit whatever you say but if definitely that is the risk to the participant right the participant would not spend this 50 uh, bar until unless the participant was coming to the center to participate in research so this is a harm you are imposing on the research participant so that must be compensated if you don't compensate it you are putting harm for the participant, right? Other side of the story. The participant is coming to the hospital anyway for routine care. But you're sitting there, you are collecting information. So it is not your role to compensate for the conveyance field because the participant was coming to the hospital for his or her care on her own anyway. So do you understand the difference between these two? Then you are not obligated to compensate that cost. So it must be identify beforehand and minimize all the risk like swelling or blackening of the skin because of the blood collection from him. Next slide. But this compensation is very true. You cannot put a compensation package for a participant which is not required, which is forcing. Say for example, so you, uh, somebody is trying to look at the benefit of one drug over other. So it is a trial. So we have a good drug and we are trying to introduce another new drug to see whether the new drug is as good as the old drug that is already been used in the com community for treatment of hypertension. So for, for giving that drug, 
uh, the participant needs to be in the hospital for 20 days. So their hospital, uh, there, there'll be hospital stay cost, there'll be convince cost, there will be food cost and other thing. These 20 days, the participant will have a daily wage loss from, from the earning. So that will be also compensated. So it becomes a very large amount of compensation package. This package can be, okay, I will give you 30,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks for participating in the study for 20 days. If, if it is the market price of the two 20 days stay, that is right. But if it is way beyond that, it is right, a portion. So you have to look at the usual price for hospital stay, usual price for convents, usual price for daily wage, and you can compensate that much. Maybe this is this is a day laborer would not go to the work or the three to five days in two weeks or three weeks, but because of being hospital, he will get compensation of daily wage. That is totally fine. But you have a logic. It is not portion. So I'm giving an example just to give you the sense it has to be the right compensation. Is money is the right compensation, or it is the service the right compensation? Say for example, the previous example I said. We want to collect information of hypertension from people, the community, but we don't need treatment. But someone is coming up with hypertension. Either you pay for treatment, or you get treatment, you go to the hospital, it's a convince fee, or you advocate them and uh, train them, educate them where to go, how to get benefit. The first one may be considered coercion, right? Because you're giving money. But second one is natural. If his or her hypertension was identified, otherwise he or she would take this natural course of going to a facility of primary care and get treatment. Did I, did I make myself clear? So you have to understand this compensation is not coercive. This is a normal course of action by the community. But there are some tricky things. The hypertension is easy, right? What about you are doing a reset or mental health? Maybe depression. Depression is a clinical condition and it requires treatment. So you have a research on depression, identifying depression in women, and you want to develop a strategy for future intervention. What is the depression level? Who gets a depression? Uh, so, and uh, how the whole process works, what, what kind of services they need or they have. So finally, I want to come up with a solution what can be done for these women who suffer from depression? And you find depression, uh, quite a number of people, and you just collect data, okay, and you do nothing. You can say, okay, you do the right thing. Okay, there are facility where you can go. You can get the facility. A service is free of, free of cost. But you find a patient who has suicidal ideation, who has tried suicide. He or she is a participant. What can you do? How far do you go? Any idea? I'm not asking for an answer. This is tricky things. I'm giving you these ideas in your head. Things are not as easy, right? Every condition, every situation must be judged on its own merit. And you have to understand what could be the harm. This participant, you know the participant has suicidal ideation. This lady can go back home and tomorrow she can commit suicide. But you knew about it and you didn't do it. Or you did something that was not adequate to prevent that suicide attempt or suicide that happened, which could be avoidable. Do you understand? So here you have to judge, make a judgment about your moral, ethics, human conscience, everything you have to bring together to understand what is the best course of putting a compensation mechanism for this kind of participant research in mental health. So those are tricky things, but there are some other things that we need to also consider like privacy. So in our society in South Asia, we live in a very close community, right? We are so collective. Uh, so there's no privacy. I don't know who gets privacy. Everybody's around. We don't have me time. We don't have private space. We're always crowded. And people ask, what do you do? What happened to you, right? You don't have a moment to uh, you can, uh, I mean, to even to think about yourself or just rest. People talk, oh, why are you coughing? What happened to you? Why are you sitting quietly, right? The 
public space is very limited for us. So in this kind of community, can I skip slides this? No. In this kind of community, it is very difficult to get a privacy. So if, when you are asking a question about the research or data collecting data, so you will see there are a lot of people around the participants, sometimes in a community. So this is important. Probably he or she would think, oh, this is a very normal question asking about my family, about my uh, migration. And you can talk about it before everyone. Uh, my whole family can do it. But this is your job to create a private space, privacy for the participant. So whatever the information she or he is sharing with you, it must, must be done in a private environment. And you are the only person who is going to listen to it and document it. But this is really uh, difficult in a hospital setting or a biomedical setting, just crowded. And in, in a crowded, in, in a uh, country like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, South Asia, mostly, it is very difficult to allow people, uh, not to allow people who are around, right? But if you don't create this private space or privacy, it is, sometimes you cannot get value for, you, for two reasons. First, you may not get enough attention for making them understand what type of questions are asking, what is the what is type of information you're trying to get from her. She'll be telling you something else. Second, she or he may not tell you the truth. May, may translate the truth, or may not give the right information. But why are we doing the research? To get the data, the real data, right? What is it? What is in, in happening in your life? We want to hear that from you, and we want to hear this information from hundreds and thousands of other people like you, so that we can come up with so understand the problem and can recommend the solution. So it is also important if you cannot offer privacy or extra privacy research, it is also discrediting the institution from where you are going to conduct research as well. So it is a responsibility, not as an individual researcher, also as a part of the research institution. Next slide, please. But as I mentioned, uh, this is very difficult to maintain, and particularly the culture, um, cultural norm that we're living in a collective community. That's, that makes us makes our uh, offering privacy more difficult. Next slide, please. Now come to the confidentiality. This is more serious. For confidentiality, uh, traditionally, in our concept for, and this in Bangladesh, that is in the organization where I have been working for that years. We always tell the participant, we will collect information and lock it under a key in a, in a secure cabinet. And I, I came across with this question, why will you lock my information? Is it wrong talking to we do do it? Is it a crime uh, to giving this information? I have to think about it. Why I'm talking to you? This is really important. How you convey the message of the confidentiality? The, the principal rule of confidentiality is the data. The volunteer supporting you to collect data is absolutely precious. So you have to put full dignity to the to the information he or she is providing. So it is a it is a, a notion of showing how much we care for maintaining confidentiality or data privacy that you are providing us. So we say, we will put your data in a locked cabinet or secure computer, nobody will have access to it without the, except for the researchers. So it is also important that you maintain the confidentiality not only really data, but also when you are identifying individuals or community, even in a report, dissemination. it's also important you maintain that. We use photographs in many publications, very commonly in reports. So this is also important whether you take consent from them that can be displayed and, and otherwise you should not. But there are two types of ways that you can put your data confidential. One is you can anonymize data. Or that means all kind of identifiers, name, address, and other identity. You just remove them. Either you use some other encrypted code or other things and to put the identifier separately. We need to track our participant all the time. So we can put it separately. But you anonymize those data during an analysis and also when you share the reports. But when you we face a common problem when we collect data in a hospital setting or in a surveillance system. Where there's also data been already, already data been collected, and we are also collecting data for research. 
data for survey segment collected by the facilities and we are collecting information for research purpose. Those are service related data as well. So if those are connect collected in the same platform, you have to be very careful. So how you can separate service data from research data. So people may have access to service data, but you have to make all the questions to make sure that nobody can get access to the research data. But when you talk about the confidentiality, you have to present in a form, concept form and make people understand what will be the level of confidentiality. It is most of the time it is difficult to make an absolute confidentiality, right? So say for example, I am doing a research in Matla demographic surveillance in Bangladesh, which is the longest health and demographic surveillance in a developing country, which is more than 60 years now, right? Longest health and demographic surveillance in a low and middle country. If I report, say for example, I'm just making it up. If I report that uh, something like HIV AIDS, I'm just making it up. HIV AIDS in Matla is higher compared to other uh, um, another, another district we have researched on prevalence of HIV AIDS. This is, if it is a fact, it's the honest confession. So you, you are going to be honest research and publish, publish and report it. What would be the consequence? Absolutely. So, by the way, uh, HIV AIDS is not a problem in Bangladesh at the moment. In Bangladesh, it is prevalence is very, very low. Something like zero point zero one something less than point one. So, so this is very low. But if that is the case, it happened in India actually. One research, I'm not going to name the area, but it's like India. That stigmatized people in that community. So it is very important for you to tell what is the level of confidentiality that we will not be able to. Uh, uh, keep your name of your uh, area separate from the report because this is what we're comparing with, with, between uh, area A and area B. But we'll be, uh, we will be keeping, uh, we'll not publish your name or address anywhere. Nobody will be able to identify you. So whatever the level of confidentiality that you can maintain, you must mention that. Next slide, please. So, but there's a way you can ensure confidentiality would be only collect the data you need. Don't collect identifiers. You do not need for research. We have a lot of extra information. Try to avoid that. Store the identifier separately. This is also a good way of uh, uh, maintaining confidentiality. And tell the participant who may have access to data. Your report. Uh, and that is very important that how you will also keep their identifier secret, such as we use a code against your name, or you use a pseudonym against your real name. Nobody will know who you are, so don't worry about it. This kind of sharing of confidence is very important to get uh, informed voluntary consent, because you need to build trust, right? What are you doing in a consent, a consent process? You are actually building trust, relationship with your research participant. Why? Unless you build the trust, the participant will not give you the real data or adequate data or full data. So which you need for research, next slide please. It is also very important. What, when you say, we will do this at least with your data, fine. But data don't fly away. Data don't get perished, right? They don't vanish. They don't disappear, they stay. What do you do with that? Your data, your sample, or your picture. What will you do with that? For how long? Will you destroy it? Will you store it? Will you send it to another laboratory, another group of people? Will you do more research with it? Will you do genetic research? You have to tell us. Or if you don't know what will be done with the data stored today or sample stored today, tell them. We will store your sample for next five years or 15 years, but we, we can't tell what will be done, but we will be doing such a certain examination or future analysis with your data. You have to tell them. If you promise to store data or sample for five years, you must destroy it after five years. 
That is what is the future use of information. But one thing I want to caution you, whenever, whenever you think about future use, you must get the concept before. Because finding this participant, if you do not try to do something uh, new that was not a part of the research, and you didn't take concern for that, it is stored in your lab or in your uh, database, you just can't do the, run the test because you, you, that is a different study. You did not take permission from the participant to that different to do that different study. So it is better to foresee what kind of research you may do in the future and get the concept ahead of. Otherwise, you have to go back to the same population, same participant from whom you got the data to reconsent in order to use the stored data or sample in the future. So it is not an easy business. We have to think about a lot of things that may happen in the future. Right to participate and read. This is something you, you do simultaneously, right? So you empower a participant for making a decision. But at the same time, you also have to tell, you have the right to read. You have the right not to participate. You have the right to say no whenever you want. Even you participate in the research. Every time when they're making a decision, when you are collecting data in the process, when they are giving samples, when they are making uh, participating in the examination, every time you need to give them the opportunity to stay, say no. I am doing this. Are you okay with it? You know that I'll do it. Are you okay with it? You have to do it all the time. So in the whole process, you are reminding them, you have the right not to person. You have the right to say no. You have the right to withdraw in time. Can I proceed now? This is what we generally don't do. This must be done all the time. But every step, every point of your research uh, action changes, like data collection to sample, sample to physical examination. Every time you need to ask for it, for that component. But you, if you don't do that, you just don't give the autonomy of the participant to understand they have the right to withdraw. Again, why? Because the power relationship. You are a researcher, you are well educated, you are a preacher, maybe you are a doctor, he's like a god, your profession, right? So you have to remind the participant you, uh, you are the god here, you are the sole authority to make a decision, you have the right to say no, that will not harm your treatment or benefit. But this concept, there is a dilemma. How will you reserve the right of the participant when you are conducting a research on a very severe way, such as someone with a stroke in a hospital, someone in hospital with mitral infarction and heart attack, serious issue. They may be conscious, they may not be conscious. They are not in the right state of mind to give you consent. Somebody who is mentally, mentally compromised. Or somebody who is in the ICU and unconscious. But you are doing the research on them. Some of them got far with dies. There's no way. But some of them, probably most of them will be coming back from the situation, right? If they get good treatment. So how do you ensure their right to participate? Because when you enroll them in a study, you didn't have a chance to ask for consent. Probably ask consent from the family, guardian, or elsewhere. But if you didn't ask for consent from the participant, you for consent. So how do you ensure their participant was voluntary and you give the full autonomy to withdraw? Who can tell? Anyone in the Zoom? This is a very tricky question. Anyone in the Zoom? Raise hand, please. Anyone in the room? Raise hand, please. I see one hand. Okay, somebody is very brave. <laughs> yeah, not for the participant. How can you get consent from the participant who is unconscious today? May come back after two, two weeks. Any other? Um, uh, we can uh, take consent from the, uh, in case of Bangladesh, from the relatives of the patient, or in case of other country, uh, uh, 
from uh, related uh, healthcare professionals. You can take option. Okay. We got maybe from the guardian or healthcare professional where the hospital where the patient is admitted. But can the provider give consent for a research participant? That's a different question. Probably another day is of discussion. It is very hard, right? I'll put you in a difficult situation. Only thing you can do, what we have first, that is I have first. And I, I just debated this yesterday when I was sitting in the National Research Ethics Committee. When the patient comes back to a normal mental state, describe everything, anything and everything that happened, that consent was given, and then ask whether she or he is still willing to participate or continue in the study, or she or he wants to withdraw from the study. Can I do that? That would be the only way you can still empower the participant to continue in the study or withdraw, right? That is the only way. It is tricky. I don't know how many people will agree with me, but this is what I advocate. It's like this. So the final, final footprint, lot of people, not just a lot of people. I also ignore this in my early career, the signature part and the dates. Oh, who cares about the signature? Okay, you give signature, fine. I, what's the name correct? I didn't even know this. When I was, I was talking about my very early age, I am just a medical, refreshed medical graduate. I didn't understand why we did that. The verbal concept is good enough. But this is very important because this is the only testimony to prove that you have gone through the process, the participant has learned it, understood it, and then signed it because it's an agreement, not a legal agreement, but it's an agreement between the participant and researcher, what two of you agree to do together, right? So they're, they're either you are educated, if the participant is educated, they can sign their name, in many communities, they feel stigmatized to tell that we, we don't know how to sign. But thumb impression is also important. You have to tell them very respectfully. Either you can put your thumb impression or write whatever you want. Age is very important. That is not mostly for legal issues. If someone ever challenges you, oh no, I didn't give consent for doing the study or the enrollment in the study. These researchers are lying to me or I was not even aware that I have been told this and thing, these things to be done to be this kind of test to be done with my blood. I was never told is a lie. That signature and the date will say yours. That will be the only testament for the IRP to tell whether you have uh, violated the ethical conduct during research or not. I just want to add one thing also important. In recent, <coughs> the participant signature is not enough. There should be Researcher's signature, and we you cannot put the PI to all in one thousand participants. So you are collecting data. So you are the representative of the PI, principal investigator. So you can sign. That is already taken for granted. But in many research, this three-party signature is important. There must be some witness. This witness can be some someone responsible adult in the family, or it can be someone team member who is responsible and taking the responsibility of witnessing. The whole process has happened. Why do we need witness? Witness agrees, testifies by signing with the date. The whole consenting process has happened in my in front of me and I can do that. But what if the researcher does not get a consent to write it? Or refuses, the researcher uh, refuses to give Consent in writing, that's it. Oh, my verbal consent is good enough. Or is it just says, Oh, I don't need written consent, I need verbal consent. So what is the difference between a verbal consent and uh, written consent? First, in online, this last slide for my lecture, first part of the lecture. Anyone, what is the difference between a verbal consent and the written consent? Anyone online? Mohina, who else? Bohima, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, verbal concept means uh, we just uh, verbally explain to the participant about the uh, purpose of our study. And uh, in terms of written consent, we put uh, an, uh, 
informed consent, which is written in a paper. And we have to take signature and uh, we ask them they, do they agree or do they agree to participate in the study. And uh, if uh, we take uh, written consent, there is yes, no option. And if verbally, we just verbally uh, talk okay. with them. Okay, thank you, Vima. So you, you are saying, so in the written consent, so there will be paper, there will be signature. And the verbal consent, we don't need any, any paper, right? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, yes. Any other comments? Any other feedback? Over the phone. Okay, it's so the same response. Okay. Any different opinion? I'm asking, everybody said that. The verbal consent does not need a paperwork. Written concept needs a paperwork and that. I, I would you like to add to that. Add, yeah, yeah. I would like to add. Actually, the individual, uh, in case of verbal concept, uh, we we must. There is some uh, written uh, things, but in case of illiterate patient, we have to verbally explain all things about the study. Uh, in case of literate patient, he or she may uh, study the consent form. Okay. okay. So I knew you'd struggle. <laughs> It's not a mistake. It is a common gap of understanding. So let me make it very clear. I'm talking to 91 plus 20, 100 plus people. Verbal and written, both consent uh, paper documents. Now, when you say verbal or written, it is considered from the perspective of the participant. That does not waive the right not to put a signature of the researcher, and the witness. In a verbal consent, the participant himself or herself does not give a thumb impression or a signature dated. But it is the job and the responsibility of the researcher to sign on his or her behalf. And of course, have another has it must have another witness who can testify, yes, this whole process has happened because of verbal consent. So only difference between verbal and written consent is in the verbal consent form, there is no room for signature of the participant, but there will be room for the researcher or researcher witness and the researcher and the witness of the research consent process. Am I clear? So verbal consent doesn't mean I have verbal commitment and no need of documentation, no. Verbal consent is also a written document without the active written document, written signature, either thumb or signature of the participant. So please learn it, learn it today and remember it and practice it in the future. So that is the last slide for now. I really enjoyed. And I just want to tell you, this is just the snapshot and the tip of the iceberg of the huge ethics concept. So the boxes I have cho showed you, what are the component of the involuntary consent form, sorry, voluntary consent form, informed voluntary consent form, each topic needs to be discussed over a day. Thank you very much. Over to Rabila. So ma'am, uh, because of the shortest of time, uh, what Sanjay suggested to have the question and presentation for five minutes, so that because we have some of our online uh, participants so that they can ask questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alia, for a very informative session. I'll just ask a few questions from the Q&A uh, posed by online participants. It would be have, have been great uh, if they would have asked themselves. But in uh, view of uh, time, I will just quickly ask those questions to Alia. Uh, so one of the questions was, how can researchers maintain the authenticity of informed consent during translation from English to local languages? and uh, have, while doing research with indigenous communities, how can the researchers uphold the, all of the criteria of informed consent? Yeah, this is a very important question. And we face it everywhere because generally these IRBs don't review any uh, protocol in the local language. It has to be in English mostly. And you have to develop these forms in English. But when you administer the consent, it is in, in, in the local language, either 
in uh, even in India, there are multiple dialects, right? Not even one language will uh, fulfill the requirement of the language for, for all the communities. So it is very important that you, this is a very important question and the answer is, you need to recruit people from the community for researchers to be, to be part of the research team. And they will be involved with the translation of the research language from the English constant to Bangla, uh, local language. And often what we did in different difficult situations that the language is new to us, we actually shared with the community and I tell them to justify us whether we use the right translation of, of the theme. And then we put it in, in the local language. And but the, the researcher may not understand the local language. So it is always a practice that you retranslate the consent into English again. That is called back translation. So translation of the English consent form in or other consent form in the local language in, in conjunction with the community participation and retranslate it or back translate in the official language to check its authenticity. Thank you, Arya. That was helpful. Uh, one more question. Rayan wants to know how researchers can effectively communicate the time constraints and potential impact of delayed approvals to the research ethics board. Are there any specific approaches or arguments that can help convey the urgency of the research without undermining the ethical review process? I think we can all benefit from your response here, Arya. <laughs> I think that is a that is a frustration of all the researchers with IRBs, right? IRBs are so harsh, give so many comments and there it takes a longer time to review. Okay. It depends on the institution. Some institutions have their regular ethical review committee meeting at a fixed dates. It is, it is easier for the researcher, but you must remember one thing. What is discussed in the IRB is a collective knowledge and there are experts and ethicists in the team. So, and they are better knowledgeable than a researcher. So whenever they pick up some issues as a researcher, I must be respectful and try to understand what is the notion. If I, it is very important that I understand what they're asking me to do. Or most of the time they give some solutions as well. They, they when they pick up some problems. So if we can be more attentive to the issues they raise, and then be honest, what we can address, what we cannot address. And then in our response, we also say, we need your suggestions, how to solve this, because we, we couldn't come up with the solution, so we'll benefit from your suggestion. That is also helpful, number one. Number two would be, rather than arguing with your, uh, with your um, logic, rather try to understand, as I say, and sometimes we, let the approval be given, but if still something are being asked illogically, we argue on that, but that must be based on a very strong reference and background. If you can do that, the process will be very smooth. What's the second part of the question? Any specific approaches that might be helpful? Okay, that is one of the approaches. The second, okay, third approach would be, if you don't understand or you have reservation, you set a meeting with the chair of the committee and try to understand or communicate with the chair or the director, whoever is the formal person to talk to. That resolves a lot of conflicts of understanding or decision. Over to you, Nabila. Yeah, so uh, I think we are at the end of our uh, webinar today. Uh, just to thank all of the participants who joined online and also face-to-face. Uh, -face. So we have some upcoming uh, research club sessions that we will post in our TJ, the Global Health Network Asia platform as well. So stay connected with us and thank you so much again for joining today's webinar. Thank you to all of you who participate online and also in the session here. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.